Good evening. My name is Barrett Ashla, and I'm really delighted to have you here. Um, Richard's exhibit opened here about four days before I began um, at the Brower Center, so I feel like we've been on this parallel journey, which has been a tremendous honor. Um, so welcome. For those of you new to the Brower Center, we are a creative ecosystem. On any given day, our building is alive with uh, an incredibly wide range of participants. On the three floors above us, there are 30 organizations that call the Brower Center home. These are uh, organizations working on a wide range of environmental and social justice issues. Uh, and these organizations range from pioneering organizations like Earth Island Institute and Friends of the Earth, which were both founded by David Brower. Um, but we also have the Center for Eco-Literacy and Impact Hub Berkeley, which is a collective um, of many different social entrepreneurs coming in and out. We like to think of our anchor tenants as our lakes and um, Impact Hub as the stream flowing in and out. Uh, we are also a conference center, so perhaps some of you know us through that um, bit of, of work that we do. We serve as, as a venue for hundreds of uh, events throughout the year that range from science competitions, where to look at these posters makes your head want to explode, um, to board meetings, to corporate events, and all kinds of academic symposia. Um, and again, as Michael was saying, we have a website that lists many of these, or, um, and many of these events um, that are open to the public. There's a whole range, but please do check out our website. But then there's what I consider the jewel in our crown, which is the Hazel Wolf Gallery, where every year the Brower Center presents three very different exhibitions. Um, David Brower wrote of a photographer fr friend he said, he taught us to see. Seeing the world through the eyes and works of an artist can inspire and it can inform. And that's really why we have um, the Hazel Wolf Gallery at our core. Art can deepen awareness of the beauties of nature, the threats to it, and the sorrows and promise of human society. Experiencing art that takes the natural world and its peoples as subject, whether as observer or creator, can build awareness and engagement, and hopefully makes advocates of us all. Again, that is why when this environmental and social engagement center was created, we very clearly put that gallery at, at our core. So every autumn, the Brower Center presents an Art Act Award. The, the award is presented to an artist who has demonstrated extraordinary achievement at the convergence, the convergence of art and activism. And this year, we honored Richard Misrak. Richard is one of the most influential and prolific artists of his generation. In the 1970s, he helped pioneer the renaissance of color photography and large-scale presentation that are a widespread practice today. His photographs are held in collections of muse museums worldwide. And this particular exhibit that we have here today, or this um, season through January, uh, features Petrochemical America, a unique collaboration between Richard and landscape architect Kate Orff. As you will hear tonight, this project brings into focus the complex economic and ecological forces that have shaped the industrial landscapes, uh, and landscape of the Mississippi River's Cancer Alley, mapping cycles of resource extraction and transformation from a local to a global scale. Richard and Kate's extraordinary book, Petrochemical America, was selected by the American Institute of Graphic Design as one of the best books of 2012. The book is a collection of beautiful but haunting images of the human impact on the natural world. I'm hoping each of you will have the opportunity to purchase a book after this evening's lecture, um, which will be selling right outside. So without further ado, Richard. Thanks, Barrett. All right. Voila. Okay, so uh, what I decided what I decided to do, um, instead of just talking about Petrochemical America, which I will get to, and and sort of talk a little bit about that, and it's a small enough group, so it'll be fun actually to take questions and answers because uh, that's actually usually the best part of the lecture. Anyway, um, I actually uh, wanted to show sort of the overview of the last 40 years of my work and put 
Petrochemical America in that larger context. So I'm going to take in, and especially because uh, a lot of the work in, involved, I was involved with Berkeley, so I thought that uh, for this audience it, it might be particularly interesting. Um, my first major body of work uh, began in 1972 when I was 22 years old, and it was a series of photographs I called Telegraph 3 AM, and they were, um, all the photographs between 70, 1972 and 74 were made um, on Telegraph Avenue between uh, Dwight and campus. And I'm just going to show like three or four examples of photographs from each series as I go through. So the photographs were basically the street people uh, in Berkeley uh, during that period of time. And this is the body of work that I, I basically cut my teeth on photography. I photographed every day. I, I went out on Telegraph. I'd go back. I was um, uh, running the lab on the Berkeley campus, the photo lab, and I would go there and develop my film and print all night and then go back out and photograph. I did that for about two years. And the early work was black and white along the traditions of people like Bruce Davidson, and Danny Lyon, um, even Diane Arbus. The next body of work, uh, that was published as book Telegraph 3 AM in 1974 with I think about 65 photographs. Uh, the next body of work, um, I, I got tired of photographing people. It was too intense and uh, difficult, and I and it was I decided to um, and I was reading a lot of uh, um, sort of visionary literature like Gurdjieff and Blake Ospensky. Um, the Castaneda books came out around those times. The Teachings of Don Juan, if, if you all remember that, or some of you might. Um, and so I went to the desert in search of uh, in search of cactus. Uh, I didn't have to deal with people, and I basically, uh, for that period of time, I just worked at night. I didn't make any photographs during the day. I just would stay up all night, take a, a big strobe, go into the desert and barbecue cactus with this big, powerful strobe. This was a way for me to, in a sense, uh, develop my own language, if you will. Um, the Telegraph 3 AM work, which was, I got my foundation of of uh, you know making high quality prints and certain kinds of seeing um, came out of a long tradition and by going into the desert and working in an area that working at night solely at night and working um, in, in a way that uh, with content that really hadn't been photographed very much before it allowed me to create sort of my my own language for the first time I felt like I came up with my you know my first real body of work. This is actually a sandstorm. Um, I got through six images before it broke my camera, but I, I love this image. And um, what was the previous image? The previous image. This is actually a photograph of Lake Havasu in Arizona desert, and it's at night. And um, the uh, that's a star. It's a long exposure, and then um, the star is going through. And then during the course of the star you know, uh, the uh, long exposure, a cloud passed through and blocked part of the star and then moved out of the way and it leaves that kind of calligraphy of that kind of dash, that beautiful little, I don't know if you can see it that well, yeah. it's, it's pretty, so yeah. So it, that's something that I exploited in later work. I went back in, in later years with an eight by 10, I'll show some of those too, where I really got into the, uh, the sort of calligraphy of, of the stars at night. Um, the other thing I should mention here too, the earliest work, the Telegraph 3 AM was all black and white. At this point, I started experimenting with different um, kinds of uh, chemicals in the dark room and came up with this uh, unique split toning uh, process where the highlights and silver areas of the black white print remained sort of a neutral silver, and then the shadows would turn into a deep, rich rust brown. And it would do it would be a chemical process, so you, you know the print would be immersed in a tray, and it would just it would react to the print and the silver in the print. And it, it was sort of a really beautiful quality that just worked uh, perfectly on certain images. And so that's why you get this first introduction of color in my work. This is a photograph of Stonehenge. Um, 
I really loved this. I had, went to Berkeley as a math major, and um, this to me was a, a perfect geometric uh, uh, sort of puzzle, which is that you have an isosceles triangle, which is the stone. You have these two, I wish I had a, um, uh, a pointer, but basically you have these two, the, the square, which um, basically in the history of art, you're, you're always told avoid the square, it's a static um, format, and it's, it's, there's no way to make a successful picture in that form. But the square itself is then broke up into the sky, which is one triangle, and the ground, which is another triangle. And then to cap it off, uh, in the right-hand corner, you have these three stones that create pi, which is a, a mathematical symbol. And I just thought uh, having all that in one photograph was just kind of extraordinary. Another photograph from Stonehenge, which I photographed in 1976. And then from there, I, you know, I've begun to introduce color into the work. And then in the late 70s, I began to embrace color full-fledged full with um, using an 8x10 camera, switch from a medium format camera to an 8x10 camera, photographing in full color. And I started a series called The Desert Cantos in the late 70s, uh, which uh, continues to this day. It's an epic project. Um, each of the cantos is like a chapter in a novel. Um, or a subsection of long poem. It's, it's, it's inspired by um, Ezra Pound's 50-year-long uh, 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 poem called The Cantos. And so basically what I do is I do a series of photographs of the, of the terrain or man-made fires or floods, um, space shuttle landings and so on. And each of those series is a series or a chapter under itself or a canto. And then I put them all under a larger umbrella and it sort of complicates and, and informs the larger project in a, in a very rich way. So this is the uh, first canto you're looking at is called the terrain. And essentially the, the terrain, which is a starting point, is, is a landscape with uh, uh, details of civilization uh, colliding with the natural world. These photographs were made uh, probably beginning uh, late 70s and actually continue to this day. I'm still uh, working on this project. Some of the cantos are done in seven days, like the space shuttle landing. It was just like a one-time deal. Others are an ongoing, continuous, never-ending project, just by definition. Uh, the third canto is called um, The Flood, and it's about a uh, man-made flood in the Salton Sea in Southern California between 1983 and 1985. This is called Diving Board Salton Sea. It's the flooded Texaco station. And generally, the cantos, like I said, sometimes there's like... Um, maybe six or seven images that will complete a canto, and others, there's, there can be up to three or four hundred images that create one single canto. This is the, um, also the flood of Salton Sea. The fourth desert canto, I'm skipping some just because we don't have all night, and uh, generally I'm just doing like, you know, four examples from each of the cantos roughly, just so you get a feel, but, um, you know, this is a Desert Fire number one, but there's um, uh, Desert Fire 249. I mean, there's a lot of them. Uh, and this actually is a, a man pointing a rifle. It looks like they're on the same plane, so it looks like he's shooting him. In fact, this is the way photography lies really well. These two men are on very different planes, and the guy with the gun is actually shooting rabbits that are coming out of these controlled burns. The, bur the fires that I photographed were all man-made fires. They're either... Um, control burns, uh, control burns that got out of control, arson, a number of the fires were started by an engineer for the fire department over a couple year period while I was photographing. Um, sometimes they're just accidents, but they're not like natural fires or lands, uh, lightning strikes or anything like that. This is uh, the uh, desert fire number 43. This one, um, the great uh, photography curator at MoMA, John Sarkowski, described this as a messy Wizard of Oz. 